All right, maybe we'll get started and people will trickle in as I'm doing introductions. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, just so you know, this event is being recorded. I'm going to begin with the land acknowledgement. This land acknowledge acknowledgement is for the land on which Whitman College is located, but I encourage you to similarly acknowledge the indigenous presence and history of dispossession of whichever space you call home currently. We acknowledge that the land we live, teach, and learn on is part of the traditional homelands of the Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Cayuse peoples, ceded during the Walla Walla Treaty Council of 1855. We recognize the continued presence and sovereignty of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation on the reserve lands near Pendleton, Oregon, and throughout the surrounding area, and acknowledge their stewardship of this land as we work alongside them today. Okay. It is a great privilege to welcome, virtually, Dr. Robert Jacobs, who is joining us today from Hiroshima in Japan. Dr. Jacobs, and my screen is not scrolling for some reason. Dr. Jacobs is a professor at the Hiroshima Peace Institute and the Graduate School of Peace Studies of Hiroshima City University. Dr. Jacobs is a historian of nuclear technologies and radiation technopolitics. His earlier work was on the effect of nuclear weapons on American culture and society. That is the subject of the book that he authored in 2010 titled the Dragon's Tale, Americans Face the Atomic Age, and the volume he edited titled Filling the Hole in the Nuclear Future, Art and Popular Culture Respond to the Bomb, as well as many other books and journal articles. His curated exhibition of Cold War material culture ar artifacts, New York, New York, it's a clever name, but it's a mouthful. New York, New York has been installed at museums and galleries in the United States. Dr. Jacobs' more recent work is on radioactive contamination. He co-founded the Global Hibakusha Project, which conducts field research at radiation affected sites and in radiation affected communities around the world. His book based on this research titled, Nuclear Bodies, Radioactive Decay of Self, Community and Planet will be published by Yale University Press in 2021. Dr. Jacobs is currently teaching a fantastic remote class at Whitman. The title of his talk today is Nuclear Colonialism, Selecting the Irradiated. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Jacobs. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us here online. And I'd really like to thank Whitman College for hosting this event and uh, Dr. Biswas for uh, also hosting it live and in person and inviting me here. Um, so I'm going to talk about essentially the history of nuclear weapon testing in the atmosphere and where these tests happened, why the places that were tested were selected um, and the power dynamic between the testing nations, the irradiating nations and the populations that were irradiated. Uh, this is both for test sites that are domestic and test sites that are located outside of countries that have the weapons. Um, and there is always a power dynamic. Um, people who have nuclear test sites built near their homes, uh, in a sense, the nuclear test sites are built there because these people don't have the power to stop that from happening. Nobody wants to live downwind from a nuclear test site. So there's a kind of a colonialism involved in this selection. And the colonization, in a sense, it's not that of resource, um, it's not that of material, but of being envisioned as a non-place. Uh, the marginality, the powerlessness is the resource that was drawn upon in uh, the nuclear occupiers, as it were, to focus on their lands or their surrounding seas where they lived. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'm going to switch to a presentation mode so I can show some photographs to illustrate what I'm talking about. And then we'll come back for some questions and answers after a little bit. So uh, bear with me while I make the switch. Okay. Um, 
So as I say, uh, we're talking about nuclear colonialism. The first thing that I want to quickly go through is what effects nuclear weapons have when they detonate. Um, the three main effects that we tend to speak of are blast and heat and radiation. But what's really important for us to understand for nuclear test site population is that there's two forms in which radiation affects people. Prompt radiation, which stays fairly close to the nuclear weapon explosion, passes right through the bodies of everybody close enough to the explosion. But then also what's called residual radiation or what we tend to call radioactive fallout. And that's particles that spread downwind from the site of the test. Uh, these particles stay radioactive for different lengths of time. Some of them stay radioactive for thousands and thousands of years, for much longer than people live. And especially for people who live near nuclear weapon test sites, it's the fallout that is the key. The fallout is what is the weapon effect that goes outside of the test site boundary and affects people that live nearby and even people that live somewhat distantly. Um, this was known even before the first nuclear weapon was detonated, that this was something to be expected. The first nuclear weapon detonated was the Trinity test in New Mexico, three weeks before the nuclear attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, in which the Manhattan Project tested a nuclear weapon nearby the Los Alamos lab. Um, this is a map showing ranches and farms uh, and their distances from the Trinity test. So there were a lot of people, even though it was thought that this test was done in the desert where nobody lived, there were plenty of people that lived downwind. Um, the Manhattan Project had radiation monitor teams prepared to monitor radiation and potentially to evacuate people if there was radioactive fallout that rose to too high of a level from the Trinity test. So they were prepared, they were measuring the fallout from the Trinity test and they were prepared to move people out of the way. Um, some of the fallout, just to give you an example, some of the fallout came down on the border of Illinois and Indiana where it contaminated a cornfield and some of the stalks from the corn were later used to make cardboard boxes that the Kodak Corporation shipped film in. The film was all exposed when it arrived and the Kodak company realized it was because the boxes were radioactive from fallout from the Trinity test. There were actually newspaper articles about this in the fall of 1945 in the United States. Well, we all know what happened here where I am in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki in August of 1945, two nuclear attacks were conducted uh, against the populations that live in these cities. The weapons were aimed at civilian targets, not at military targets, but with weapons of this size. You can't really separate civilian targets and military targets. So we, we, all of us know this, what happened here, that people were attacked, that people experienced the detonation of this weapon and horrific things. Um, this is the map that we tend to show here in Hiroshima that shows the areas that were affected. The red shows where the fires burned and the concentric circles show you the distances from ground zero. This gives you a sense of where the blast went to or where the burst of uh, prompt external radiation went to. It, those, the blast wave and the, ra and the prompt radiation went out uh, to essentially about three kilometers and then dissipated after that. The fire spread a little further because the fire continued to spread among the wooden buildings. But what took a while for people here to understand and is still not really part of the story is that the mushroom cloud drifted after it rose up into the air and it began to drop a lot of fallout outside of Hiroshima. Uh, here that was called black rain because there was so much soot in the cloud from the fires that the particles had a lot of uh, soot along with the radioactive particles. So it fell as black rain and contaminated a fairly large area. So there were people uh, two, uh, 20 kilometers away who received radiation from the Hiroshima blast but we don't think of them as hibaksha, as people who survived the nuclear attack. They only gained that legal status decades later as it was understood that many people suffered health effects because they were near the radioactive fallout. Well, now I wanna look quickly at nuclear testing and then we're going to look through the five countries that tested nuclear weapons in the atmosphere and where they did it. Uh, these are nuclear weapon test sites. 
nuclear weapons were tested all over the world. There were over 2,000 nuclear weapon tests conducted since 1945. We tend to think of the Cold War as a period of time in which nuclear weapons did not explode. In actuality, statistically, there was a nuclear detonation every 9.6 days during the Cold War. The Cold War was a period of time in which nuclear weapons were exploding constantly. Nuclear weapons were tested on every continent except South America and Antarctica. Um, now this map shows you some of the specific sites and some of the numbers to give you an idea of where nuclear weapons were tested in large numbers. The site with the most nuclear weapon tests is Nevada in the United States, over 900 nuclear tests in Nevada. The main nuclear test site of the Soviet Union was in Kazakhstan, uh, almost 500 nuclear tests there. Um, but we'll look at some of these specific sites uh, in the next few minutes here. Um, the important, one of the important things is there were 2,000 nuclear weapon tests, but about three quarters of them were underground. And those don't spread fallout the way that tests in the atmosphere with mushroom clouds spread fallout downwind. So most of the fallout came from atmospheric testing. And also, as we'll see uh, briefly, I'll point, I'll show you an illustration hydrogen bombs, H-bombs, which are literally thousands of times larger than the kind of bomb used here in Hiroshima, uh, create unbelievably large fallout clouds. So there's a difference between A-bomb tests and H-bomb tests. <clears throat> well, the United States tested more nuclear weapons than any other country, over a thousand nuclear weapon tests. Uh, 67 of those nuclear tests were in the Marshall Islands, uh, over 900 were in Nevada, and also a series of H-bomb tests were done in the Pacific nation of Kiribati. The United States began to test nuclear weapons less than a year after the attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the Marshall Islands, a small trust, now it's an independent nation, the Republic of the Marshall Islands. At the time, it was a trust territory that was put under the stewardship and trust care of the United States. Um, the United States was looking for a nuclear test site. They announced in early 1946 that Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands would be their nuclear test site. The statement described it as, it may accurately be described as one of the most remote places on earth. Uh, Admiral William Blandy, who would oversee the tests in 1946, uh, said it was important that the local population be small and cooperative so that they could be moved to a new location with a minimum of trouble. So test site locations are frequently spoken of by nuclear testing countries as empty uh, or as having a small number of people who don't really have uh, uh, an enduring culture or presence there. In the Marshall Islands, testing was done at Bikini Atoll this is the various atolls and islands in the Marshall Islands. So it was in the north at Bikini Atoll that nuclear weapons began to be tested. And also testing was done at another atoll called Eniwetok. These are the two nuclear test sites in the Marshall Islands. The people of Bikini, I think, I forget the exact number. I think there were about 140 people living on Bikini Atoll. Um, they were forcibly evacuated by the United States. Uh, here is a, a clip from a film in which the U.S. commander he, sitting here explains to the Bikinians that the U.S. has invented this terrible weapon, but now they want to use this weapon to create peace, and so they need Bikini Atoll as a place to test the weapon, and he asks for permission from the people of Bikini to use their land to test nuclear weapons. Of course, the people of Bikini had no choice. They knew this. Um, and as a matter of fact, this photograph is not actually when they were told that nuclear testing would happen on their land. Uh, they were told after church on a Sunday, the uh, American military governor of the, of the Marshall Islands told the uh, Bikinians when they were leaving church on uh, Sunday that the U.S. was going to use their land to test nuclear weapons and that they would be like the children of Israel seeking the promised land and they would be moved to a better place. What we see here is something that was staged for the American public. You can see here the filming. 
Six days after they were first spoken to, the U.S. gathered uh, the elders from Bikini again and reenacted them requesting permission to test nuclear weapons there and being given permission. Uh, they reenacted it six times so that they could film it from various angles and make sure to have all of the footage that they needed. The Bikinians, fortunately for them, were never exposed to radiation because they were forcibly uh, they were displaced. They were forcibly removed from their islands. They were moved to much smaller islands with uh, far less resources and uh, far less uh, capacity to do fishing, um, where they were put in temporary housing. Uh, they were moved three times in the next several years before finally settling primarily on the capital atoll of Majuro, where they are, where they were still people from somewhere else, not natives to that atoll. So um, Bikini Atoll is so radioactive that people can't live there still. Uh, so Bikinians may visit there, but most Bikinians live in Majuro Atoll, hundreds of miles to the south now. Uh, to give you a sense though of what really happened in the Marshall Islands, you have to understand uh, hydrogen bomb testing. This is, the first deliverable hydrogen bomb that the United States tested. This is the Bravo test in 1954. So a hydrogen bomb is a completely different process than an A-bomb. Um, it's thousands of times larger, uh, but the important thing is the fallout clouds created by these giant weapons. This is a map made by the US military of the fallout cloud at the Bravo test, and it stretches for hundreds of miles. Uh, this cloud engulfed several atolls downwind uh, here at Rongelap Atoll. Later on the day of the test, the U.S. had radiation monitors that arrived there to check the radiation levels. The radiation levels were so high, they panicked and left. Two days later, a uh, U.S. Navy ship evacuated everybody from Rongelap uh, to take them away, and they still cannot live in Rongelap now. Um, it's still too radioactive from this fallout cloud. Uh, there was a Japanese fishing boat, the Daigo Fukuyumaru, known in America as the Lucky Dragon. About three hours after the test, ash began to fall on that boat. Uh, all of the crew, when it returned to Japan, was hospitalized with radiation sickness. One of the crew members died. So he was 100 miles away from this hydrogen bomb test, and it, and it killed him. The radioactive fallout killed him. Uh, the U.S. took this map and superimposed it on the eastern seaboard to try to imagine what would happen if this weapon was used on Washington, D.C. Uh, they concluded that if this weapon was dropped on Washington, D.C., first of all, everybody in Washington would be killed by the explosion, but the entire populations of Baltimore, Philadelphia, and 50% of the population of New York would die if they were not evacuated immediately, and they would die because of radiation exposure from fallout. So less than 10 years after Hiroshima, you have a weapon that can kill millions of people and it kills them with fallout. It doesn't kill them with the blast and the heat of the nuclear weapon. Uh, the entire population of Rongelap suffered radiation sickness and were evacuated, as I said, by the US. The US tried to move them back in 1957, but People there began to get sick again, and eventually the entire population left Rongelap, and they also live in Majuro, the capital atoll. Uh, once, the, once the Soviet Union got nuclear weapons, the US opened its nuclear test site in Nevada. Uh, here's a map showing Native American Indian reservations around the test site in Nevada. And here also is the immediate downwind population, which is primarily a Mormon population. This is Mormon population in the West and in the United States. The United States referred to, the US government referred to the Nevada test site as a good place to throw used razor blades, a place where really nobody lived. Yet at the same time, the test site, which is located here, had a policy of only testing weapons when the winds were blowing to the east and never testing weapons when the winds were blowing to the south. So when the winds were blowing to the south, the fallout would have gone to Las Vegas and Los Angeles. So here you see an instance of the US actively choosing which population will be irradiated by the fallout clouds. 
it will be the people that live to the east, the Native American communities and the Mormon communities in southern Utah. Uh, there were lots of weapons. This is a map made by the United States military showing the paths of fallout clouds across the United States from the test site, which is located here. Every place that is dark is a place where at least two fallout clouds crossed over. Uh, this is a quick survey, by the way, running through this quickly. The second nuclear weapon state was the Soviet Union, over 700 nuclear weapon tests. Uh, almost 500 of them were in what is now Kazakhstan, near a town called Semipolitinsk, now called Semi. Over 200 nuclear weapon tests were also tested in the Soviet Arctic here on, on Novaya Zemlya, which was not too far from Finland and Norway in the Soviet Arctic. Um, here we can see these are various sites in the nuclear, in the Soviet uh, nuclear complex. Here is Kazakhstan. And the polygon, the test site, was located here in Kazakhstan. The Soviet leader of the effort to find a site, uh, Berea, the infamous, uh, notorious security leader in the Soviet Union under Stalin, he referred to this area of Kazakhstan as unpopulated. He said that there, were no, there was nobody living there. He also said the Kazakh population was a nomadic population, which did not have a permanent culture or permanent housing. Yet in the villages just outside of the polygon, there were 20,000 people living. And in Semipolitinsk, the city that is about 110 kilometers away, there were over 100,000 people living. And this is the direction that the fallout clouds went, was towards these communities. Um, The Soviet Union tested not just A-bombs, but also H-bombs there. This is the first Soviet H-bomb test in 1995. This is a nearby village. In the United States, the United States would not test H-bombs at Nevada. They tested H-bombs only in the Pacific Ocean, either in the Marshall Islands or in Kiribati, because they did not want those huge fallout clouds crossing the United States. The Soviet Union tested both weapons in Kazakhstan. So those massive fallout clouds that we saw went across these villages outside of the polygon, dropped their fallout, and unlike the fallout that lands in the ocean, which disperses into the ocean, it doesn't go away, but it disperses, the fallout that came down on these villages outside of the polygon simply embedded into the ecosystem there, where it continues to cycle through the soil and plants and animals and people. So you see much more incidence of uh, health impacts on third and fourth generation people living in these villages like Dolon village here, because there is such a presence of radioactive material in the food crops and the uh, food system of the people who live there. Uh, up in the north in the Arctic is where the more hydrogen bombs were later tested, and that includes the largest weapon test ever, which was the Tsar bomba. Uh, we measure nuclear weapons by the force, the energy they give out, and we measure them by how many equivalent tons of TNT they equal. So for example, the weapon here in Hiroshima was about 15 kilotons, so it released the same energy as 15,000 tons of dynamite. Uh, here you can see the Hiroshima-sized mushroom cloud compared with H-bomb mushroom clouds, which released in the Bravo test 15 million uh, on 15 million uh, megatons, 15 megatons, so 15 million tons of TNT. The Tsar bomb released 50 million tons of TNT. There's no limit to how big you can make these weapons. And the weapons that go up this high are putting their fallout up in the stratosphere where some of the fallout will circle the earth before it falls back down to earth, which has resulted in global contamination. Uh, the fallout has spread around the, all over the planet because of entering into the stratosphere. The UK had 45 nuclear weapon tests, 12 in Australia, 19 in Kiribati, and then some at the Nevada test site. So please notice the place where they did not test nuclear weapons. They did not test nuclear weapons inside the UK. No nuclear weapons in their own country. They began testing in Australia, uh, in first on a tiny island in Western Australia, but then in Southern Australia on Aboriginal territory. 
They put up signs prohibiting people from entering this territory, but they put them up in English, which many of the people living in the communities did not read. Uh, they really almost systematically ignored the presence of indigenous populations in test site areas and in areas that were later irradiated. They put up warning signs about radioactive areas, but again, in English. Um, there was serious disruptions to many of the communities in Australia whose traditional lands were used for these tests. The food system was affected. Uh, people were displaced. Some people were moved uh, many, many kilometers away. So they live now in places where they did not understand the patterns of hunting of animals that they would hunt and also when and where to find water in a desert environment. So there were very serious disruptions to ongoing and traditional culture and also inherited wisdom about food and water procurement in a very difficult desert setting. The Australians would not let them test H-bombs in Australia, so they moved the H-bomb testing out to Kiribati, this small island nation in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they tested it Christmas Island on Atoll. It's over here in the Line Islands in the center, really, of the Pacific Ocean. The British tested hydrogen bombs in Christmas Island, and then the United States also tested 20 hydrogen bombs in Christmas Island. The people there were given essentially no information at all about what these weapons would do and the effects these weapons would have. This is the community of survivors and Hibak Shah who are now advocating for health care in Christmas Island uh, in Kiribati. Um, during our field research there, we were told that they had been given no information at all about these nuclear tests until a visit in the 1990s by some British veterans who were there with the BBC to record a story about their experiences during the testing era. Uh, it was then that they realized that the cancers that were endemic in their community may be related to their exposures as children to radioactive fallout. The French, over 200 nuclear tests, 22 in Algeria, 195 in French Polynesia, the French claim that all French nuclear weapons were tested on French territory, but you'll notice there is not any nuclear weapon tests inside France. Both of these places were colonies at the time of the testing. Algeria was a colony, uh, but the war of independence was happening at that time. So even as they were testing in Algeria in the early 60s, they were preparing a second test site in the colony in French Polynesia. Um, nuclear weapons in Algeria. Here's a fallout cloud map showing the spread of radioactive fallout throughout Western Africa uh, after a, a specific test. When the French left, they just left. They did not secure the area at all. Uh, people went in and dug up a lot of the metals that were buried in the test site area. And a lot of this metal has made its way onto the market throughout uh, the region, exposing even more people to radioactivity. They went down to French Polynesia and they tested out here in the southeast of French Polynesia. Uh, here's where most of the population lives in the society islands where Tahiti is, but the fallout clouds from these incredibly large hydrogen bombs that the French were testing down there, uh, they have now admitted that they spread far more fallout throughout Tahiti and all over the region than had been previously described. Um, this is a monument in Tahiti to the victims of nuclear testing. Uh, in, just a few years ago, in 2014, the French government tried to forcibly remove this from the park where it's located at the waterfront in Tahiti and locate it in the center of a traffic roundabout so that it would not be seen by tourists in an effort to suppress uh, ongoing information to tourists about the nuclear testing that happened there. Um, to show you the other kinds of efforts they went to, the French sent spies which planted two bombs on a Greenpeace boat, the Rainbow Warrior in Auckland Harbor in 1985 and blew the boat up, killing one person to keep it from uh, soon going out to protest during a French nuclear weapon test. The Chinese detonated 47 nuclear weapons, all of them at their test site in Lopnor in the far north uh, west of China. Um, 
here is where the nuclear test site is in Xijiang province. This is the traditional homeland of the Uyghur population. Uh, certainly, most of you have been hearing about the treatment of the Uyghur population in the news recently. Um, and it was this population of non-ethnic Chinese, of uh, Islamic, uh, the Islamic culture that's present in China. This was where the test site was located. Um, so now I know I've, I've run through this really quickly in an effort to try not to take uh, too long. But what I want to express to you is that these, these weapons, um, there, there were no test sites on the east coast of the United States. There was not a test site outside of Moscow or St. Petersburg. You know, the French did not test weapons in France. The English did not test weapons inside England. Um, even China, they did not test it near the, near the, dom, near the main ethnic Han Chinese population. Uh, always, the populations that were selected for where these tests happened were populations that were politically unable to stop these tests from happening. They're typically people of differing ethnicities, race, religion, and certainly socioeconomic class. Um, and it's not as though there was no understanding of exactly what would happen to these populations. Just as an example, this is what the United States, this is a United States military document, a statement in that after the first tests in the Marshall Islands in 46, this document was published in 1947, and it shows that they completely understand the use of fallout as a terror weapon. We can form no adequate mental picture of the multiple disasters which would befall a modern city, blasted by one or more atomic bombs and enveloped with radioactive mists. Of the survivors in contaminated areas, some would be doomed to die of radiation sickness in hours, some in days, others in years. But these areas, irregular in size and shape, as wind and topography might form them, would have no visible boundaries. No survivor could be certain he was not among the doomed. And so, added to every terror of the moment, thousands would be stricken with a fear of death and the uncertainty of the time of its arrival. So there was a complete understanding of the use of radioactive fallout as a way to kill people long after the attack and to create terror in a population. So these are some of the effects in, in communities, sickness and early mortality, forced displacement, living with con continued living with dangerous radiation in the ecosystem, loss of food sources, loss of inheritable wealth. If you abandon your community, you cannot pass property on, rupturing of ancient knowledge chains, manipulation with disinformation, uncertainty about health and risk and anxiety, medical subjectivity being studied after you're exposed to radiation, dislocation from ancestors and ancestral land and cultural disruptions. Um, however, I do wanna point out that especially after the Cold War, community building happened between many of these communities immediately after the end of the Cold War, this association, the Nevada Semipolitansk Association formed, linking the Native American communities outside of the Nevada test site with the traditional communities outside of the Polygon test site in Kazakhstan. And this kind of community building in which people did not just see themselves as politically aligned with the powers that irradiated them, either showing allegiance or, or animosity, but this understanding that what happened to all of these communities was a shared global history has been an empowering step for many of the people in these communities in the post-Cold War world. And so I, I know that was all too much too fast, but uh, we have a limited amount of time. So I, uh, I beg your indulgence for the swiftness of that survey, but now we can get on to some discussion. Um, it leaves us with time for questions. Um, so I'm going to propose that we take questions in two forms. So somebody already raised their hand, which is one way of taking a question. What I can do is I can unmute a person who raises their hand, or you can type a question into the Q&A box. The chat box is uh, disabled. So either one of those works. Um, so let me try the 
unmuting. Roger Johnson, you're on. Yes. Okay. Am I unmuted? Can you, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I visited the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum a few years ago. They had a display which showed that about 2,000 Japanese continue to die every year uh, because they lived on the outskirts of Nagasaki in August of 1945. I, I'm wondering if you're familiar with this display. Is this true? Is it, can, is it so? In other words, a lot of times we hear that about the immediate effects. It's really the long term effects, and they continue for 50, 75 years after this happened. Can you comment about this? Yeah. Um, in the case of Nagasaki, where people were directly attacked with the weapon, and both things are really important. Um, Lots of people were exposed to the burst of radiation that happens when the weapon explodes. This lasts less than a minute, but it's really dangerous if you're close enough to receive a lot of radiation. So many people died and got sick as a result of that initial exposure. Um, however, the presence of a lot of radionuclides, the presence of fallout in the ecosystem that, that lands in the dirt, that deposits into the, and people internalize through uh, eating food and so forth, uh, this is an ongoing risk that continues for a long, long period of time. Um, although one of the things I would point out, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically about Nagasaki, there was a study a few years ago that showed that there was more radiation present in Nagasaki today from the fallout from global nuclear weapon testing than there was from the original attack. Um, so there's so the, those exposures are exposures that are global. They're, they're, they're all over the place, not just in Nagasaki, but certainly it's the case that people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki continue to be exposed to radiation uh, even, even after those initial attacks and the burst of radiation dissipated. And they continue to die today. We, yes, although some people, some of them may, die, may continue to die today because of illnesses that were, that were begun long ago. Not because, of Ill, not because they were exposed to it today. Let's just say that there were radioactive particles, fallout particles. People may have gotten them inside of their body 20 years ago, and those particles are irradiating the cells around where they deposit in the body continuously. So that will develop disease in people. So some of why people are dying today is probably because of exposures that happened earlier, rather than being exposed to radiation this year and dying this year from that. When that's particles the, are internalized, when that's particles what the, are internalized, it, sorry, that's what ahead. display claims. That it's not old age, it's not medical things. It's the exposure received on the outskirts of Nagasaki, and that's why they're dying today. But they qualify. Do they say when those exposures happened in the exhibition? Uh, I mean, in yeah, words, in, in, in August of 1945, they were on the oh, outskirts. Ab absolutely. In, in that case, absolutely. Yeah, people who if let's just say some of the material in Nagasaki was a plutonium weapon. And one of the things that's created is, is some of the particles of plutonium were scattered and strontium 90 is another particle that's created in this detonation. If people get those inside of their body in 1945, the body tends to place those, those specific radionuclides in the bones or in the teeth. So over the course of a decade or two, it's very possible for internalized particles like that to create leukemias, for example, um, and, uh, and other uh, cancers of bone marrow. And um, there's different, different particles create, end up creating different cancers inside of people, but internalizing those particles, absolutely, that can kill people. Thank you. Okay, there's a series of questions in the Q&A box um, so I'm going to take three of these and combine them. Um, three of these questions are about what one can do. Um, so there's one that says simply, what can we do? Um, and a different version of that same one saying, what can we do to spread knowledge? Um, and there's one that says, as a young college student, what can I do to help the communities affected by nuclear colonialism? So some version of, so what kind of actions are possible? Uh, those are all really important things. It, it's, 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 uh, we, we shouldn't just think this is the terrible thing that happened, but we should think that there's things that we can do to resolve this. 
a lot of the people that live in these communities are living with enduring threat and risk from living in contaminated places. So some of some of the things that we can do, first of all, is we can work to abolish nuclear weapons. This is a fundamental thing is we need to get rid of these weapons and uh, and not have a risk of their being detonated and used again. Um, some governments are considering start restarting nuclear testing, for example, the United States and also Russia. Um, so we need to work against the uh, against the armament and uh, and the, uh, these weapons as systems. In terms of these communities, one of the main things that we can do is we can advocate, which the treaty for the the, the ban treaty does advocate for, for the responsibility of countries to remediate and clean up the radiological messes that they made in their test sites. For the most part, almost no country has done anything to clean up any of these sites. They've abandoned them when they're done. And there's ongoing risk in these places. Um, so what we can do is we can place demands on the countries that did these things for them to actually compensate the people and provide medical care for people who were exposed and actively work to remediate and remove radionuclides from these ecosystems or if there's really severe contamination as there are in some places to construct new villages, new towns and homes and have people live in places where they're free from this radiation and their food systems are free from this radiation. So essentially holding governments responsible for what they did and trying to compel them to be actively working to remediate these problems is certainly the best thing we can do. Um, there's another question which is related a little bit different. Um, from Professor Knight, which asks, is there any discussion of reparations to communities affected by testing in the US, UK, or France, or any country for that matter? Um, yeah, there is. Uh, there, and in the ban treaty, there is some language around this, but in terms of what's happened in each country, um, for example, France has a program to compensate victims of radiation from the nuclear weapons program. Uh, but almost every person who has been approved for compensation is somebody who was an employee of either the military or the scientific apparatus for testing. I think there's 10 people in French Polynesia whose applications have been accepted for compensation. So uh, similarly, in, in the United States, there's some compensation for some of the downwinders from the Nevada test site. But for the most part, there really is very little compensation for anybody. Um, the nuclear ban treaty does structure this in, but we need even we need nations to be more proactive. So for example, there's a lot of health problems in Kazakhstan from the test site there. And the Kazakh government asks the Russian government every year to provide assistance in remediating villages and providing healthcare. But the Russian government says, our government didn't do that. That was the Soviet Union and we are not the Soviet Union. Um, and so there's, there's continually these ways that nations sidestep their responsibilities. Uh, so there are some programs, but those programs almost exclusively help people who were employed within the weapon complexes rather than the villagers and people, indigenous populations that experience the fallout. Right, there's also the challenge of claiming compensation, of making the yeah. case that any particular health effect was caused by um, nuclear testing, right? So that cause and effect um, relationship is hard to establish. Absolutely, and especially because particles that are internalized tend to result in ingestion cancers frequently, like lung cancers or stomach cancers. And there's a lot of causes. These are very common cancers. So it's very difficult to prove causation because it's almost impossible to prove for most people that you have internalized a particle. Right. Um, somebody asked, could you talk a little bit a little more about France's testing activity in Northern Africa. I don't know if you wanted to yeah. add more to that story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the French, the French, the Algeria had been a colony for hundreds of years and uh, was fighting for independence at the time that France decided to test weapons there. Um, and the French testing was even for those of us that study this was notoriously sloppy, uh, and there there was a lot of for example, there was one, this was in French Polynesia, but there was a test that was put down a shaft and it got stuck. The weapon got stuck. It didn't go to the bottom and they just detonated it anyways. And it caused a small tsunami. Um, so the French, when they left Algeria, they just took all of this radioactive equipment and material and just buried it under the sand and left. Um, they, it, so they're, 
there, I'm not sure, there, there's other stories I could tell just about some of the craziness that, that endured in the testing. The, when they sent the first two weapons there, they lost one of them. It fell off a truck in the desert. Um, but the whole time that the French were testing there, they were in a really big hurry because they knew they had a very short window in Algeria before they were going to lose the country. It was very clear they were going to lose the war at that point. Um, so they were moving very, very quickly and acting very, very sloppy. There's a very active organization of French veterans who have documented a lot of what happened in Algeria. And there was also, I would point out, complicity by the independent Algerian government. The French continued to test even after the government declared independence. That was part of the negotiation the French worked out with the new Algerian government was continued testing for a few years in Algeria. Um, all right, there's a question by Margaret that I can no longer see. There it is. Hi, Margaret. Um, regarding those survivors in Japan who were outside the immediate blast zone and suffered from the fallout and black rain and were only later officially recognized as survivors of the blast, procedurally, what was the process, uh, what was the process that led to that recognition? Um, well, one of the main things was the health problems that occurred in the community that were clearly, that there was clearly health impacts, uh, much like people who entered Hiroshima, people who entered Hiroshima to look for relatives or to help after the attack, many of them got sick and it was understood a little quicker that they were sick because they were exposed to radiation, even though they weren't there when the weapon exploded. Similar health problems developed in the black rain communities. And also there was documentation of the falling of the black rain. And, uh, and so, but it's ongoing now. There's still court cases now, it's 75 years later. And some of the people are still seeking to advocate for their rights and for uh, compensation for the harm that was done to them. So it's, it was not a simple process and it's not finished even still. Um, I, and so there, I, I encourage you all, there's, there's uh, court cases just in this summer that have been ongoing here in Japan uh, in relationship to the Black Rain events, but it it but it one of uh, it so it it took a long long time for people to be recognized at all. There's a question from Blythe, who's in our in your class. Um, what connections do you see between communities surrounding other locations affected by nuclear weapons, i.e. mines, sites of production such as Hanford, transportation such as Great Bear Lake, etc., and legal global Hibakusha? Do you think that there is a possibility for these communities to aid one another and help to work towards nuclear non-proliferation? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And there's a lot of similarity because in almost all of these communities, people are encountering radiation in the same form, which is in particle form, which they can internalize inside of their bodies, or it's being dumped into the ecosystem around a production site, a mine site, or a plutonium production site like Hanford. And it's embedding itself into the ecosystem and entering into drinking water and entering into uh, agricultural products. Um, this is the similarly true where the plumes came down by Chernobyl and Fukushima. So many of these communities are suffering similarly. And there's definitely a lot of linkages that can be made and there are active linkages being made between many of these communities. Um, I know at Hanford, the core group, which several of us here are, are involved with is actively linked with communities in Fukushima and uh, some of the global test site communities and production communities and working to help advocate holistically for all of these people who are affected by radiation and specifically affected by, uh, by particle radiation, by radionuclides in the ecosystem and contam ongoing contamination. Um, so these are very much a similar community. And, and in, in a sense, there are no legal global hibakusha because there's really almost no community recognized, fully recognized in any legal way. I mean, even in Chernobyl, where you have this massive plume that came down and you know, lots of people clearly affected by it, you still have the World Health Organization tell you that only 50 people died at Chernobyl, only people who died in the plant itself. And so uh, the, the basis for which people have any rights because of their exposures is it's a minuscule community. It's a tiny, tiny community of people globally. 
Um, I, I'm just seeing that Professor Norma Field is here and she put in a note saying, I think she wants to say something about why the Japanese government has been less than eager to recognize claimants. Uh, oh, I thought on the Black Rain question, we should have Norma. Norma can give us a much more uh, a much more informed response. So I'm going to um, no. I'm going to see if I can unmute Norma. If I can find her. I know we should make use of Norma's I got expertise. It. <laughs> Hi, hi everybody. There you go. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for this occasion, both of you. Actually, I was hoping I, I, I meant to put in a question mark whether Bo would address that from his from his own vantage point. Why the Japanese government allegedly representing right um, the Japanese uh, sufferers of the A bombs has dragged its feet at every stage of the game in recognizing. Um, claimants um, uh, who want um, health, uh, health, medical help, as well as in severe case, well, and, and, and find economic help too. So I wonder, first, if you'd say a word about that, Bo, being there, living in Hiroshima for a number of years now, it is, I mean, just as the Japanese government has refused to even take part in the negotiations for the TPNW, it's been quite, um, let's say cold, to its own citizen sufferers. And I wonder if you'd say a word about that. Sorry, I muted <laughs> myself. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, exactly. Why, why is the Japanese government of all governments not quickly signing the treaty and, and advocating for it? Because uh, you know, there's lip service paid to nuclear abolition every August 6th and every August 9th by Japanese prime ministers who visit these cities. Um, but the U.S. and the Japan has a military relationship with the United States. And so it politically finds that the United States interests are its own interests or it behaves as though that's the case. Um, you know, Japan has a policy that nuclear weapons cannot be uh, housed inside Japan, but the U.S., you know, kept nuclear weapons in Japan for decades with the uh, knowledge of the Japanese government. Um, so on the one hand, you have the political allegiance to the United States and to the United States military um, uh, military posture in the, in the world and the fact that Japan is under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. Additionally, you have millions of people in Japan who were injured during World War II and Japan has always worked to separate the Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Hibakusha from other people who suffered serious health problems from fire bombings and from all kinds of things. Uh, Japan neither wants to uh, have any uh, obligations from its own egregious acts, its own uh, aggressions during wartime, nor does it want to compensate the large amount of the population that experienced, uh, that experienced attacks and bombings throughout the war. So the Japanese government has not been quick to take care of, caretake its citizens or advocate on their behalf or advocate the, the, the overwhelming interest of people in Japan for nuclear abolition. Um, if I can just say a word then about Black Please. Rain. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Bo. Yes, that really clarifies the field. Um, one of the things from the summer, and I'm so glad you showed us a map of the uh, areas covered by light and heavy rain because it's not a map we see very often of where the black rain fell. But there's been a, um, a d wish for a long time now for uh, black rain um, sufferers to have that zone expanded according to extensive research undertaken by the city actually of Hiroshima. And, um, and the Hir Hiroshima District Court um, delivered a wonderful decision this summer, just before the 75th anniversary, and the central government forced the city and the, um, and the prefecture to appeal that, so it will go to higher courts, so that these very aging uh, Hibakusha will have to suffer some more. I think some of us see, uh, we make, uh, the world has tried to put up a firewall between nuclear uh, power and nuclear weapons, but um, 
I think part of the difficulty that Black rain victims face now is the reluctance of the government to show in any way recognition, expand, an expanded recognition of what internalizing radionuclides can be. Uh, can mean because they don't want to acknowledge Fukushima sufferers. So there's a way in which the treatment of Hirosh uh, black rain from Hiroshima, Nagasaki seems a little different, but there is still that. The new A-bomb sufferers recognition uh, for the government runs the risk of having to recognize Fukushima sufferers. And so there's a feedback loop um, designed to keep parties who have suffered from acts of government in both places um, to, to be, that they have to contribute to each other's being denied acknowledgement of their suffering. So this is something to keep an eye on. Thank you. Abs absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norma. Thank you, Norma. There is a question actually about what do you think about the future of nuclear power, which um, I can guess. Um, but uh, but I'm going to read actually a question by Professor Udin here on colonialism um, that came before that. Um, it says, I think some of the assumptions around the exercise of colonial power is that it is systematic and in command of the violence it inflicts. This seems to fly in the face of the way exposure works. Even the recurrent image of the mushroom cloud conveys some of the idea of being out of control with these weapons. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that tension within what you call nuclear colonialism. Yeah, I think that's that's a very good point. I think that there's a mixture here of, you, you, there's an understanding of the weapons, the, the basic what's going to happen when these weapons are detonated, but the effects are so large, they're utterly uncontrollable. Um, so just to get back to uh, Algerian testing, there was a test in Algeria in which multiple members of the French parliament came down to observed the test and the test was terribly botched and blew off the side of a mountain and exposed all of the government ministers to uh, the fallout cloud. Um, so they're at the same time that clearly this weapon, they understand the scale of the weapon, controlling it is, is essentially impossible. Um, and so what, there, so there's, there's an, and that's part of the reason this has to be done in colonial spaces because of the inability to control it. Uh, the inability to limit the effects to the test site and the inability to even predict what the effects will be. Um, in, in the Bravo test, when that massive fallout cloud occurred, the US government, part of the reason that they did not intervene to bring out, say, the people from Rongelap uh, on that first day was that they were so busy evacuating their own personnel because they were in chaos. They had no idea that it would create this massive fallout cloud that would go where the fallout cloud did. So there's both, there's enough control and enough calculation to choose these locations, to understand the importance of not testing these weapons inside your own continental boundaries. But beyond that, the, uh, it, it is playing with fire in a sense. And so, um, so it, that doesn't fit that, that model of controlled violence, of predictable, Dis, uh, deliberate, articulated violence. It's it's uncontrolled violence, sort of let let loose someplace where it's least likely to affect the people that are considered important. Right. I mean, it's uncontrolled in its effects, but it's very controlled in its targeting. Right. Absolutely. Uh, um, so there, it, there's that, that's exactly there's the calculation of why certain places are picked. That, that's exactly right. So, for example, the United States did not test hydrogen bombs inside the United States. So it's you can look at there were 900 tests in the U.S. There were 67 tests in the Marshall Islands. So far less than 10 percent of the U.S. tests were in the Marshall Islands. But 80 percent of the yield, 80 percent of the energy and radiation released by all nine, uh, all 1000 U.S. tests were those 67 tests in the Marshall Islands. So that's that's control. That's controllability. We, even though the United States, almost all of the weapon tests were in Nevada, they were able to concentrate all, not all, but they were able to concentrate the vast majority of the impact on uh, human beings and on the ecosystem outside of the United States in its colonial territories or its semi-colonial territories. So that is control. Um, right. Selecting these locations, that is exerting control. That's choosing 
who is irradiated and protecting other people from being irradiated. That's right. Um, we have a few other questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to ask uh, you to end on that question of the future of nuclear power, because it is very much a possibility that's alive and even preferred by those who want to see a, a carbon-less future, right? It's, it's, it's provided more yeah. and more as a green panacea sometimes. So I want you to address that question of nuclear power as, as an alternative. Um, certainly. Um, so the first thing I would say is that it's it's really not viable as a uh, as as a way uh, as a, as a fix for global warming for global heating. That's not going to work. It it takes these plants decades to come online, um, and at this point the cost overruns are are massive. So it's not something we can quickly scale up in order to replace other uh, other kinds of energy. I would also say that typically when we're presented with nuclear power as carbon neutral, that's simply looking at the carbon footprint of a nuclear power plant during the period of time that the plant is operating. But in order to get to that period of time, you have to do a lot of mining of uranium. You have to do a lot of milling of uranium. And there's a whole carbon footprint that goes into the front end before we measure that carbon footprint of nuclear power, which is typically left out. Additionally, nuclear power creates waste. First, spent nuclear fuel, which must be contained for 100,000 years. Uh, even decommissioning nuclear power plants takes decades because of how radioactive the material is. And then all of that material, the buildings, the walls, the equipment, all has to also be stored. That carbon footprint is left out of our assessments of the carbon, uh, of, of, the, of how much carbon is being created by the use of nuclear power plants. So that really makes that notion that this is really a carbon neutral uh, energy source kind of, it's really not true. But beyond that, I would say that you're creating the most toxic materials in the world. You're taking some of the most toxic materials in the world, uranium, and you're creating plutonium in the nuclear power plant, in the nuclear fuel rods. These nuclear fuel rods have to be contained for 100,000 years. So this is something that I refer to as temporal violence. We're exerting violence against future generations. Uh, there will be thousands of generations of human beings for whom the presence of our spent fuel is a risk to them in their ecosystem. Um, the only thing we can figure out to do with it is to bury it half a kilometer underground. Uh, we can tell ourselves that that will work, but everything else we've told ourselves will work hasn't gone the way we've planned. So even if we get it a little bit right and a little bit wrong, that's catastrophic for people in the future. So there's hundreds of thousands of metric tons of this material now. None of it is in permanent storage, none of it yet. So to produce more of it is a crime against future generations. And I think that we have to stop doing that immediately. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jacobs. And thank you to all our attendees for coming and um, staying for this, this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you all. Norma's still here. It's so good to see her, so, sort of see her. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Oh, thank you for chiming in, Norma. Yes, you, you hi, guys. Exactly <laughs> what I had lost in, in, in the, the way to frame it. <laughs> no, it was great. And I, I thought it was so wonderful that um, you had a question about what a young college student can do. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. To have that kind of orientation. Um, that and that your talk son. elicited that. So I think that's. Actually, great. I think that was my son who put that in. Ah, oh, nice. <laughs> nice job, mom. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> it might have been. Well, you can ascertain. <laughs> oh, isn't he the one that uh, baked brownies when we went to Tom Bailey's farm? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I see some more questions well, that are coming in. Lena, oh, are you well. still here? Thank She's gone. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of questions that I can actually sure. answer that people asked here. And I'm happy to answer anything. I mean, I'm not, I'm not running away yet. 
Bye bye. Stay well. Thank you. Take care, nice. Norma. Yeah, nice talking you to you, too. Norma. Take care. You too. This was great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. I mean, I know I tried, I, I sort of rushed through that because I was trying to cram a bunch in and then leave some time. Yeah, it didn't feel rushed to me. Um, good, good. Yeah, yeah. No, it was great. Um, and uh, there were great questions. I was really happy with the yeah. questions too. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Too bad, it was really good. And I was really appreciative of an engaged audience that had a lot of questions about it. and. You know, because it's a lot. It's a lot to digest. If it, especially if it's something that you haven't thought about before, it's right. it's a ton of information about a ton of different things. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we let you go and start your day. Okay. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> thanks a lot for organizing it, Champa, and thanks for all of your hard work. Oh, it's been wonderful. Thank okay. you. Well, Thank I'll you. see you next week. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.